everyone. Welcome to our AAD sessions hosted by Creature, our new research center for creative arts, cultures, and engagement. AAD sessions are a series of public conversations that bring together researchers and practitioners from the School of Art, Architecture and Design at London Met and the wider world to exchange knowledge, cross-fertilize ideas and between disciplines. These disciplinary sessions are usually held on a Thursday late afternoon or over lunchtime. I'm Wesley Ling, Professor of Transcultural Arts and Design from the School of Art, Architecture and Design and the Director of Creature. I will be chairing this session. Festival Cities is a panel discussion on the newly released volume, Festival Cities, Culture, Planning and Urban Life by Professor John Gold and Margaret Go. As part of a research series on performance, monuments and public spaces, today's event is initiated from one of Creature's research strands in public, organized and coordinated by Dr. Yatset Lewis Scarzel. There are two more sessions within this series in the month of March. You can find the full schedule of AAD sessions on Creature website. Dr. Scarzel is reader in art and performance at our School of Art, Architecture and Design also Creature's Deputy Director. I'd like to pass on to Dr. Scarzel to introduce his research strength in public, the research series, and most of all, our invited speakers who join us today from across the country to as far as the Netherlands. Huge congratulations to Professor Gold and Margaret Go for the book release and a warm welcome to all speakers. Without further ado, over to you now, Yaxe. Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us and I'm so excited about this event. Thank you very much Margaret and John and of course through all the speakers that are going to speak today for uh, this very exciting book launch. Um, I just want to say just a couple of outlines following what what Wessie has just said, which is that the um, our, uh, Creature Research Centre is um, you know champions interdisciplinary research with a particular emphasis on uh, on art, architecture, and design, specifically art and design. And within this particular strand called um, the performance monuments and public spaces, uh, the idea is to create a series of events that interrogate the relationship between uh, public art, both ephemeral and permanent, and the social sphere within uh, which it happens. And uh, within this broader definition of public art, of course, festivals. Uh, a, a hugely important um, component, a hugely important phenomenon. And so, um, so again, very, very pleased to welcome all the speakers today. I'm just going to introduce um, Margaret and John, and then Margaret and John are going to then introduce the, the rest of the speakers. Um, so let me just go to the biographies uh, for a second. So uh, Professor John Gold is a professor of urban historical geography in the Department of Social Sciences at Oxford Brookes University, special appointed professor in the Graduate School of Governance Studies at the at Meiji University in Tokyo and editor with Margaret of the journal Planning Perspectives. Uh, Margaret Gold is a senior lecturer in marketing and creative Inter enterprise at London Metropolitan University and also lectures at Goldsmith University of London and of course as we said she's also the co-editor of Planning Perspectives. Both Margaret and John have uh, published ex extensively on the subjects that we're going to explore today and it really is a pleasure to host the launch of this book uh, as part of our research center. So thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. Well um, I've like to give a, a personal welcome to I mean I'm just looking at all the faces and the boxes and I could spend several minutes going through saying oh look you know but um welcome to to colleagues from London Met um from Oxford Brooks and Goldsmiths and to ex-colleagues friends and family um so we're going to be starting the book launch with a few words from Anne Rudkin who is our series editor um, and then John and myself will say a few words, well, maybe a, a few words and a, a bit more about the book <laughs> and its origins and some of the key themes. And then we're lucky to have four individuals with us who've all written extensively on cities, culture, events and tourism. Um, so we'll be inviting them to contribute. Um, that's Professor Greg Richards, Professor Ian Ray, Dr. Andrew Smith and Professor Graham Evans. And then 
after that, um, there'll be time for questions and answers. So um, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce Anne, who established the Alexandrine Press in 1979 and acquired the journal Built Environment and launched the book series Planning History and Environment in 1980. And she's the series editor for um, the for, for our for our book. So I'd like to pass over to Anne then to kick things off. Right, it's a super book. I would say that, wouldn't I? But just as it was being published, all hell broke loose with COVID-19. So there were two questions that immediately came to the fore. Will festivals survive? Will cities survive? Of course, the answer to both has to be yes. People's ingenuity will prevail. It's a given that cities are essential to economic, cultural, social life, but cities without culture, as the 19, 2016 UNESCO report said, culture is key to what makes cities attractive, creative, sustainable. Without culture, cities as vibrant life spaces do not exist. They are merely concrete and steel constructions. And festivals and carnivals play a key role in the culture of cities, not to mention their economies, marketing, place promotion, and have done so since antiquity. Taking the reader from festivities in ancient Greece and Rome to the Notting Hill Carnival, Sydney's Mardi Gras and beyond, and with the help of fascinating case studies, John and Margaret Gold have produced a wonderfully detailed exploration of festival cities in all their guises. But when it comes to place promotion, part of the story, it's far from recent. In the 17th century, Venice used its carnival to enhance its image in the world. But there's a Venice link that takes me back to COVID-19. Venice Carnival was renowned for masks and still is. The tradition actually goes back to the 13th century, albeit with a few breaks. Some 20 years are, uh, and there are plenty of masks in the Sebastian paint, um, Vance painting behind me, which is on the cover of the book. But some 20 years after that painting, Charles de Lune, a 17th century French doctor, and physician to some of the Medici invented the plague doctor's costume with its famous great big mask beak. The mask proved very popular with carnival goers and it remains that's just like that today. In fact, on YouTube, you can find a beak mask parade from the 2020 um, carnival, but I don't think the beak would serve as PPE, let, or even a face covering. So my advice is observe social distancing, take your exercise, and when you're not working, read festival cities. As they say in the final line of the book, festivals are an essential part of what it is to be human. So here's hoping not too long hence, festivals and their host cities will thrive once more. Thank you, Anne. Um, so with that wonderful introduction, I'll pass over to John, who uh, yes. say something about Now, we, we have a PowerPoint. Um, can I have the screen? Ah, oh, good. You, 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 need to, you need to put multiple participants. If you can, please. Uh, yes, John, you should be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Share screen. That's it. And we will be away when we. And full size. Minimize that. I hope and pray you can see. Yes, that's perfect. Good, good. That, that, that's the last of our major worries out the, out the way. Um, <laughs> and Anna's uh, already. Um, hinted at something that must have gone through everybody's minds when you were thinking about this evening. Is that a rather strange time to be publishing a book about festival cities? Um, if, as we know, the okay. as we know, the long, there is a long and the short of this, the COVID um, pandemic 
the broke the broke out uh, at the end of 2019 and has affected uh, the world in big and small ways since that time, led to the virtual ending of for the festival program for 2020. Um, it was uh, our book was published in December, uh, December on December the fourth. And by that stage, virtually all the fest major festivals of 2020 had been canceled. Looking forward, it, it does appear that it, it will certainly be some time before normality appears. And although there are festivals scheduled for 2021, who knows how many of them will actually, actually take place. So there was, all, there was this problem that, that immediately came, came to mind. But we have to be clear that there were also other challenges that festivals were, were facing even without COVID. Um, one of the most, most serious of those, of course, was that the, there had grown a cold couch, calculating logic that saw, saw places of, of, fest, of temporary fe, festive congregation as suitable places for murder and mayhem. Examples that I'm afraid are rather easy to find. The 2013 attack on the Boston Marathon the uh, 2017 attack on the Route 91 Harvest Country Music Festival in Las Vegas, which you, you have on the, the left in the left-hand picture, which left 58 people dead and 422 wounded from gunfire for a cause that still isn't actually known. That, that, those, those figures are, are what you would expect for a, a major, major military skirmish. And then of course, the, 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 there's the memorial there from Nice of the 86 people who died in 2016 when a driver deliberately zigzagged a lorry at high speeds through the crowds at the Bastille Day, Day, Day parades. While these challenges are recognized, there is of course, as Anne has already suggested, the long view. And the long view stresses that festivals already existed in archeological time, that they have been recurrent features of major civilizations from antiquity to the present. Now, we, we resist any sense of the iron grip of history or that the idea that festivals always express the same purposes. But the historical record does show that these are the oldest manifest, some of the oldest manifestations of human culture. The desire to congregate and be festive has survived wars, pestilence, prescription, disease in the past, and it's going to do, they, they will do so again. Anne has already given away the ending of our book, which is they are festivals are an essential part of what it is to be human. But with that, that is, if that's the ending of the book, it might be worth uh, giving some thoughts as to what it, it, it was before that that led us to, to reach those conclusions. A little background, I hope this isn't too indulgent. Maggie and I are basically curiosity-driven researchers, and we previously worked on a number of related topics in this field. Uh, the three books, book covers you see there relating to some of these projects. The Cities of Culture, which came out in 2005, looked at three different sets of festivals, World, World's Fairs, Summer Olympic Games, and the European Cities of Culture, which later became the Capitals of Culture. Olympic Cities, which is also an end series, and that's sort of the first edition, uh, was about the, not just the games, but about the movement behind the games and the wider impacts of, of the Olympics on the cities that have hosted them. We also produced a four volume set of source materials called the making of Olympic cities. These, these festivals that we describe here are of a particular type. They, they're known as, these days as mega events, they have been known in the past as landmark events or hallmark events, or a variety of other other descriptions, but they're now often called mega events. And they are festivals which are non-recurrent in terms of a particular place. They move from, from city to city each time. They, they are subject to a bidding process whereby different cities put up their case as to why they should be candidates for, for these events. And it is unlikely when that any, any of the, the major events that we call major events will appear in the same place within a generation. But they are events which are expensive. They, they demand large scale event spaces and they demand infrastructure. So city managers are very keen when, when they are attracting these events 
to attract some sort of legacy. When the events, in other words, has moved away, that there is some tangible result of having held that event. So those are what we've been looking at so, so far, but it occurred to us that it would be interesting if we were able to look at other sorts of events, smaller scale events, which don't move from city to city. Those, these are called non-ambulatory events. These are recurrent. They often are, are annual, but they could be biennial. They could be triennial. And sometimes they even occur at even longer intervals than that. They're not subject to bidding. They occur, there's a commitment to the place where the, they're, they're held each year, where the event space is and the infrastructure for them already exists. Infrastructure and event, event spaces, which are developed over time, which is developed incrementally. So staging them is not, is not tied to, to notions of legacy in the manner of festivals that come and go. So to the book itself, we, the aim of the book is, is, is there. Uh, we, offer, we seek to offer a historical survey of the way that uh, recurrent non-ambulant festivals have become embedded in the life and planning of cities, particularly in Europe and North America. Now, in saying that, we're giving away something quite important because we're giving away the focus of the book. We understand perfectly well that there are important festival traditions outside of Europe and North America. There are important festival traditions in Japan, in India, in, in China, uh, many parts of Africa, festivals which also have global significance. But we're basically exploring those with which we're familiar, both as, as consumers and researchers. And those are essentially arts festivals and carnivals within the European tradition. Festivals representing other genre and cultural traditions, we feel are best left to others who are better qualified than us to study them. Also, from what you see there, we're, we're identifying the specific period in which we're, we're interested. We, we know, and, and our second chapter of our book recognizes this freely, that festivals have an enormously long history, but the sort of festivals we're interested in and the developments that stem from those festivals are those which have occurred and been founded roughly since the late 19th century. Although, as I say, our contextual analysis goes back further. So we are particularly concerned that arts festivals and carnivals founded since, since roughly Very quick thumb sketch and then a little more about what's in it. If analytically, there are two introductory chapters which set context. There are four case study chapters which look at the, uh, the specific festivals that you see there, chapters three to six. There are two, then two thematic chapters and then there is a, is a conclusion. If we can just let's take a little more. Let me see. Yeah, there we go. Um, the four case study chapters are occupy the central part of the book. In, in a sense, they select themselves. They are that important. If we start at the top left, you have the, the Venice Biennale. Found in 1895. Moving to the top right, there's the Salzburger Festspiel from 1920. Below that, there's the Cannes Film Festival, technically from 1939. Unfortunately, if you if you know your dates, you will realize that the, the slight um, hindrance of the outbreak of the Second World War got in the way there, and after one uh, one uh, pre-screening. The festival was actually uh, cancelled and it didn't appear again until 1947, which I suppose is the real start of it. And then the Edinburgh International Festival from 1947. As I say, such is their importance, they virtually select themselves. But as far as we know, this is the first time that, that they've been put, their experiences have been gathered together in one place in directly comparable form. Now, after that, Screen. After that, we have a chapter which looks at proliferation and proliferation of festivals, particularly in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, early part of the 
of the 21st century has been profound. We've got, we put, we listed three genres there, literary festivals, biennales and, and theatre festivals. And as you can see in each case, there is a very sharp take up of these. Uh, uh, and these are, we're only listing the major city, city festivals. There are many uh, more minor festivals that could be added here. We analyze the, 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 the numerical growth, but we also analyze this in qualitative terms as to the reasons as to why this particular growth would appear at these times. And we're happy to go uh, further into this in, in our discussion later, if you like. The thematic chapters finish with one on asserting identity. And we have there the Pride, uh, Pride Parades and St. Patrick's Day Parades. Festivals which have asserted identity and champion the rights of minority and ethnic groups. And then our, our conclusion takes stock of the future prospects. Of the now, before Maggie deals in more detail with the, some of the key themes of this, I'd just like to pick up three introductory themes from the first chapter, which do explain quite a lot of what it is the book is about. The first is that Festival Cities opens with some reflections on the way that towns and cities now commonly sport lengthy annual schedules of festivals of all kinds. We, we, we happen to start with quite a long introductory uh, case study of Stratford on which goes back to a famous uh, literary uh, a festival in 1769, a jubilee run by David Gary. But over the years, Stratford has built on its, uh, on its Shakespearean connections by building up a quite a formidable annual schedule of different festivals, some of which build on the Shakespearean connection and others which have rather less connection. Our opening gambit though, is that the addition of such events does more than bring in just some extra tourist revenue. Rather, and this is my second point, it changes the nature of the places with which they're associated in larger and smaller ways. In this connection, we, will we talk about a process known as festivalization. Festivalization is one of those words which many people uh, uh, use and is defined in almost every case in different ways. That's our definition. Festivalization is the process by which increasing the number and duration of festivals held at a particular place produces tangible and intangible changes in the economy, culture, and environment of that place. And that brings me to my final point, a link point, and that the key element to the book is the relationship between city festivals and these three key themes. Which is the relationship between city festivals and culture, between city festivals and the places in which they're held, and city festivals and the, the economy of, the, of those places, now often thought of as the creative and cultural economy. Maggie's now going to consider themes from arising from that further. Yes, well, obviously it goes without saying that culture is fundamental to all the festivals that we've covered in the book, and that culture is at the heart of the idea, vision, and inspiration for the art professionals behind the establishment of new festivals. Although we show a lot more is needed for a festival to succeed and endure, uh, one of the elements being, of course, the support from city officials, which is one area we do explore. Um, in Venice, the three key figures behind the initiative for the Biennale wanted a festival that would play on Venice's past as a center for the arts. But they also wanted to get away from the image of the city as an art museum and engage with contemporary art, artists and the art market. Um, whereas in Salzburg, um, as, the, as the birthplace of Mozart, efforts um, had been going on for some time to try and celebrate the city's connection with Mozart. And the statue you see there on the right was unveiled in September 1842 as part of the first Mozart festival to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Mozart's death. It was a year late because it took so long to get everything organized. Um, and they didn't manage to set up a regular festival. There were ambitions to create the Austrian Bayreuth, you know, modeling themselves on the Wagner festival over the border in Bavaria. Um, but a regular festival, as John mentioned earlier, didn't start until 1920. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, um, in the case of Cannes and Edinburgh, though, other factors were at play. And those festivals may never have taken or could well have taken place elsewhere. It was a matter of seeing off the competition from other cities. In the case of Cannes, it was Biarritz, but also other Mediterranean resorts. And of course, Venice Film Festival had already established the link between glamour, beaches, resorts and film. And so all the contenders for, the, um, for what became the Cannes Festival were, were resorts. Um, the Film Festival, though, was an initiative to provide an alternative to the Venice Film Festival, which had become politicized by Mussolini's fascist regime. And it was very much the French government that wanted France to stage a festival, and where in France was a rather secondary consideration. And also in the case of Edinburgh, the impresario uh, and general manager of Blindball, Rudolf Bing, was looking for a city suitable to host a major international arts festival. Um, and for that, he was looking for somewhere that had performance spaces and accommodation that was still intact after World War II. Uh, he wanted a city that wasn't too large because he wanted a festival to have an impact and importance for the city. So cities like Manchester and Birmingham, he said, were just too big. He had mounted a tour of Britain in 1940 with a performance of the Beggar's Opera. And um, this had introduced him to Britain's provisional, sorry, yes, provincial cities, which left him really very unimpressed. Um, there is... Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Sorry, we're just having a few, yeah. Yeah, so there is an apocryphal tale that he and Audrey Milne, one of the uh, opera singers from Glyndebourne, while visiting Edinburgh on that 1940 tour, were struck by the similarity of the Edinburgh skyline you see on the right and the skyline of Salzburg that you see on the left. And they were meant to have said that this would be the place for their festival. But in fact, Bing wanted the festival to be in Oxford. This was where he'd been living during the war. Um, he, um, recognised there was uh, ample accommodation in the in the Oxford colleges and plenty of performance spaces, but the um, the city and the university were not cooperative. While Edinburgh, in the form of John Falconer, the um, the Lord Provost or Lord Mayor of the city, grasped the opportunity presented, even though his fellow councillors had little experience or even knowledge of international festivals and had no idea who most of the artists and ensembles that uh, Bing wanted to um, invite who they were actually were. So for, for Cannes and Edinburgh, the economic impact was a key. As for cities coming later, you know, thoughts of jobs, visitor spend, whether real or perceived, the intangible value um, of image and brand, place promotion, and ideas of revitalizing the city and animating the city, even if you can only animate it for a short period, all of these assume great importance in the 80s and 90s when Western cities were adjusting to economic change. So even at this, and, but even if you go back, you know, the economic rationale for the very early cities was also um, strong. And right the way through the whole book, the role of tourism, um, is, is threaded. And I must say, I was quite surprised researching the book at how important tourism was for the early festivals. You know, Venice and Salzburg saw their festivals as a way of attracting a growing number of genteel cultural tourists, um, particularly from abroad and particularly from America. Um, in the case of Venice, the fascist regime from the 20s and 30s saw the growth of tourism as a domestic and an international project. So they wanted more Italians to experience Italian heritage and culture. And they wanted the foreign exchange from overseas visitors. Um, and it was no um, accident that Venice's film festival was located on the Lido, you see there on the right, which was the luxury beach resort for Venice, but was facing increasing competition from Mediterranean rivals. So the Venice Film um, Festival had the effect of extending the um, holiday season and associating uh, Venice with the Hollywood glitterati and others, um, um, which was really important to them. Um, the third theme after uh, 
culture and economy is place. And the interaction between place and festival happens on several levels. But here I just want to make some ob observations on the impact which recurring festivals can have on their cities. So unlike like the one-off mega events John mentioned earlier, where the rationale to stage them often involves major urban projects, recurring festivals often start with quite modest cultural infrastructure. And if they endure, and it is a big if, the cumulative impact of the festival on the city's cultural infrastructure can become quite significant, although it may require energetic lobbying for improvements to existing venues or plans for new purpose-built state-of-the-art uh, facilities, which don't always um, come off. Venice had staged a one-off art exhibition in 1887, and you see the um, map there of the public gardens that was chosen to um, stage the festival in the east of the city, the Giardini. They had to build a temporary exhibition hall and they renovated an old riding school as a concert hall. So in a sense, the legacy of this event provided the site for the first Biennale, although they had to build a new exhibition hall. The idea of encouraging participating nations to build and manage their own national pavilions from 1907 onwards allowed the Biennale to expand while keeping the cost of festival organization down. And you can see on the right how the Giardini filled up with national pavilions and expanded um, as well. For Salzburg, um, the, there was Already is obviously a series of churches, cathedrals, small concert halls, a Stadttheater, which is now the Landestheater, which you can see in the top right. But at the outset, none of these were available to the festival. And it started with a spectacular open air theater production of Jedermann in the courtyard of the cathedral that you see there in the top left. Um, and it actually started with just that simply one outdoor production. Um, over time, uh, venues were added. So the bottom left there, you see the old riding school co-opted by Max Reinhardt in 1926 for one of his spectacle, uh, spectacular theatrical productions. And in the middle there, the Kleines Feschbill House, 1926. And on the right, the Grossus uh, Feschbill House opened in 1960 on the site of the old Natural History Museum. And that gave Salzburg a stage capable of um, putting on Wagner and other very large productions that Herbert von Karajan, who was the director of the Salzburg Festival at that point, was uh, very keen on uh, doing and pressurized the, uh, the city to, to, to carry out that project. For a city like Cannes, with its civic and national backing, investment in venues was speedier and relatively generous. So it started off having to use the municipal casino that you see there at the top left, which was built in 1907. But this was replaced by the Palais de Festival in 1949 in the bottom left-hand corner there. And that in turn was demolished and replaced in 1983 by the Palais de Festival Air de Congrès a huge uh, complex which allows Cannes to stage business events, um, exhibitions and so forth throughout, uh, throughout the year. But with festivalization and growth comes the geographical spread of some of these festivals as they outgrow their initial venues and event spaces. So they tend to co-op new spaces and buildings um, and often contribute to regeneration and other urban agendas along the way. So Venice in 1980 took the bold step of persuading the authorities to allow them to use the Arsenale, the military uh, shipbuilding yards, um, at that point mainly redundant. And you can see the uh, picture on the left there, which shows the building as it was when the Biennale uh, was negotiating uh, for, for its use. Um, the idea was that the new architectural Biennale could use this space and of course they wanted really large volumes of space for its installations. And you'll see on the right how it looks now and it's used for the Art Biennale and the, um, and the architectural uh, Biennale. And this was really a stroke of genius and it accelerated and shaped the whole nature of the regeneration of the Arsenale going forward. The, Art Biennale, um, you can see here, um, 
needed to spread even beyond the um, the Giardini and the the Arsenale. Um, and as the Arsenale filled up with national pavilions, the demand for further national participation continued. And so after 1995, nations were allowed to rent spaces in the city. And the map here shows, you know, the um, events sort of spilling out into uh, the city. So that now between March and November each year, spaces are taken up for exhibition purposes. And that does generate valuable rent for landowners, for cultural institutions that rent out their space. And of course, motivate the renovation of, um, of, of buildings. And the same can be seen happening in Edinburgh, um, where the multiplication of festivals and the explosion of the Edinburgh Fringe has co-opted every and any space for performance purposes. It's now, that's the Fringe, is now the world's largest art festival. Um, and in 2019, had over 3 million attendances. And you can see there some of the uh, Biennale, uh, sorry, some of the, um, the festival fringe activity going on uh, in the street to encourage people to come to particular performances. And the map here just shows how um, the, um, the festival spreads into the city. All those little pink marks there are different venues concentrated in the old town, the new town, the insert box is Leith, which is on the, um, on the coast. And there are venues that even don't fit onto uh, that map as well. So over time, the cumulative effect of festivals can change um, cities quite, uh, quite dramatically. And that brings us around to some of the final issues and some of the points John was making um, at the start. Um, one of the issues we didn't mention earlier is the use of public spaces and festival programming. It's very attractive to have outdoor events that animate the city, provide free entertainment to passers-by, but they do disrupt um, normal patterns of life and can remove space from the public realm and raise complaints. So this is a case from Edinburgh where disquiet about the loss of access to public spaces has been growing, particularly for the, as a result of the Christmas and Hogmanay festival that you see there taking over Princess Street Gardens. And the bottom uh, image there is what the Princess Street Gardens looks like once all those temporary structures um, have been removed. John has already mentioned terrorism and the, um, and the um, need for um, security. And of course, on the right, we have COVID and the cancellations um, and scaled down offerings and virtual offerings that characterize 2020. Venice was one of the first cities to close down at the start of the pandemic, while they were in the business of setting up the architectural biennale. Um, Salzburg, in the end, did manage to have a short uh, festival. And of course, already plans are going ahead for 2021. You see there the postponed architectural biennale that's meant to be opening in May this year. Although there's obviously some nervousness about, you know, what really will be possible. And, um, and of course, concerns about people's willingness to travel internationally, particularly, um, uh, in order to attend these, um, these festivals. But our general feeling is that ultimately the festival calendars will re-emerge, although um, for some it may mean that some festivals can't survive the, the current storm and, and may disappear from the, uh, from the map for now. So on that rather mixed conclusion of both uh, um, you know, continuation uh, and, uh, and uh, cancellation, um, I'd like to introduce our first guest. So, so Greg Richards is Professor of Placemaking and Events at Breeder University of Applied Sciences and professor, professor of Leisure Studies at the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands. He's written extensively on cultural tourism, creative tourism and events, and currently his research interests center on the links between places, events, culture, and creativity. Um, his publications include, and these are books I've used quite a lot myself <laughs> recently, Eventful Cities, Cultural Management and Urban Revitalization, and um, in 2018, Small Cities and Big Dreams, 
and 2019 a research agenda for creative tourism. So I'd like to hand over to Greg now. Many thanks. Um, I'd like to thank John and Margaret for inviting me to uh, this, this event, which also gives me an opportunity to catch up with uh, a number of old friends. Um, but it's great to be involved in an event organized by Creature, um, which uh, makes it clear that uh, London Met has got a lot more creative than when I left, because uh, when I was there, the research centers were called things like Celts and Track, um, nice kind of neo-brutal crisp names, which would have been uh, very comfortable in a fascist uh, uh, edition of the Biennale. Um, but luckily things have moved on and we're now talking about a much more creative world uh, in spite of COVID. Um, it was interesting that you, you gave a, 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 an overview of your, your books on cities and uh, events over the years. And uh, I, I noted uh, a subtle shift in emphasis. So we, we moved on uh, from cities of culture in 2005 to uh, put the event first with the Olympic cities. And now with festival cities, we've moved on again. We've moved on from uh, what we might call the, the pulsar events, what, what you called the ambulatory events to um, iterative events, events which take place regularly and are much more embedded in the fabric of the city. And I think this is a very interesting move in your work and it, it reflects a need to deepen our view of events. So the historical perspective that you have is, is great because it um, takes us away from the relative shallowness of a lot of contemporary event scholarship, uh, which has the kind of idea that you have this portfolio of events which you can shift around and um, produce wonderful effects for your city without thinking about space or time or history. Um, and in fact, it's, it's very different. Um, one of the reasons why festivals in particular have become very popular with, with cities is because they are, as you say, infinitely malleable in, uh, in their nature and therefore they fit almost anywhere and can be used for almost anything. Um, I, the, the phrase that occurred to me while I was reading it was that they've become the Swiss army knife of cultural policy. Uh, you can do anything you like with them. Um, and this is what you have shown in the book that different cities have done very different things with uh, festivals. Um, and so festivals are popular because they are very, very different, difficult to uh, pin down. So uh, like most other books on festivals, uh, you don't bother defining festivals because festivals are so malleable that they're undefinable. And this is of course what makes them attractive for uh, policy makers. Um, it was interesting the, the the table that you showed us about the growth in numbers because of course this is this is the other thing uh, that makes them very uh, attractive to uh, not only policymakers but also uh, educators. You know we we're all into this idea that uh, festivals are important because their numbers are growing. Um, so then we get more uh, investment in festivals and we get more students on our event courses and all of these kind of things. Um, but the historical view um, makes it clear that it's not just the post-war uh, growth in, in the number of, of big festivals and that kind of thing, which is, which is important, but this kind of rootedness, which goes back centuries. Um, so we're not just talking about something which is a, a post-war, post-Second World War phenomenon, but something which is very, very deeply rooted. And I think that's one of the big uh, strengths of your, your book. Um, and you make a, a number of important points, including the fact that events are not just points in time, they are also points in space. And the way in which events take over spaces in the city is very clearly illustrated in your book. And, you know, it's not just the growth in the numbers of events, it's the growth in the scope of the events in the city. 
Um, and there are interesting parallels between uh, the analysis that you've done of, uh, of these festivals and uh, John Wynne's book on uh, music cities, which also provides a, a, an analysis of the relationship between different music festivals and the cities that they're, they're held in. And of course, being American, uh, he ignores the, the European aspect completely. So these two volumes are, are uh, complementary rather than uh, rather than competing. The other interesting thing for me that comes out of your analysis is the uh, the role of what we might call influential switchers, the people uh, like Garrett and Bing, who you know put time into promoting a festival for whatever reason um, and convincing cities that it was a good idea to stage them and to continue staging them and then to provide more venues and more money and all of these kind of things. And, uh, you know, it, it's fairly clear that a number of these events would not have happened or would not have persisted without these important influential figures. And these figures need to emerge at different points in the evolution of a festival in order for the festival to keep going and to keep reasserting its, its history and, and sense of purpose. Um, and that's something that I think is very important at this particular juncture that we're in. Um, so you, you come at the end of the book to the point of, yes, COVID, what do we do now? Um, and of course, you haven't got a bigger crystal ball than any of us, which, uh, which tells us exactly what's going to happen. Um, but your, your book provides, I think, a lot of hope for uh, festivals in, in the current moment, because also you point out that other festivals which are, are apparently invincible have also been postponed, cancelled, uh, stopped by wars, hurricanes, whatever, uh, at various points. Um, it was it, the, the discussion about New Orleans was interesting. You know, the fact that they, they managed to get going after Katrina and they thought that this continuity was so important. And now we're at the point where they're cancelling it because of COVID. So, you know, not, not all disasters are the same uh, is, is an interesting point. And uh, we're actually engaged in some research at the moment on, on Carnival. Uh, and so we've had to change the questionnaire to, what are you doing now that Carnival has been cancelled? But of course, it's not that Carnival has gone away. It's just that Carnival will be, be celebrated in a different form this year. And it will be back, hopefully, uh, even more strongly uh, in, uh, in 2022. And in fact, there's an interesting paper on um, uh, Rio during the, um, the flu uh, pandemic uh, in the early 20th century, which makes exactly this point that the carnival came back even more strongly after the, the, the flu uh, pandemic because people were so uh, you know, happy to celebrate the fact that they'd survived and it gave an, a, an incredible boost to tourism as well. Uh, so, so these are, are, are important themes which uh, you've given a lot of historical depth to, and I think we will be um, eternally grateful to you for, be, for doing so. So thank you very much for the invite. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Ian Ray. Um, he's visiting professor in civic design and fellow of the Heseltine Institute of Public um, Policy and Practice at the University of Liverpool. Um, he was chief planner of the Northwest Development Agency between 2000 and 2010 um, and uh, writes for Architects Journal Management Today. Um, he has published two books in Anne's series, um, uh, the uh, Great British Plans, Who Made Them and How They Worked uh, in 2015, and No Little Plans, How Government Built America's Wealth and Infrastructure in 2019. So I hand over then to Ian. Ian, I think you're on mute. You might need to. I'm trying to. Uh, the, mute. Have uh, you got me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. I, I'm delighted to be here uh, to help launch John and Margaret's book, uh, especially as a co-author in Anne Rudkin's splendid and, and splendidly um, edited series. A few words on festivals. Uh, my first encounter with festivals came at age 18 with the Bath Music Festival in what would have been, I think, 1969. Pink Floyd, mud, overflowing toilets, sleeping bags in the tent. It was unsanitary, a bit disorganised, rather dirty and totally authentic. And I loved it. In later life, my experience of festivals became rather more professional, less uh, more sanitised and a lot less fun. It's widely believed that Liverpool used its European capital of culture status, a sort of year long cultural festival to turn around its image in 2008. It's true, but, but only up to a point. In the early nineties, I worked on a report called the Merseyside Image Strategy. At that time, Liverpool had been written off as a sort of pariah city, a place with no future. I've never forgotten the remark made by um, one of Liverpool's officers in, a, in an early meeting. He said, Liverpool doesn't have an image problem. We don't have an image problem. We have a reality problem. And really, that's the point. Festivals will only work if you've solved your basic problems and you've got something to sell. Liverpool's turnaround really came from two decades of very patient regeneration effort. And City of Culture was a selling, selling job. In the wake of 2008, Liverpool got what I would call festivalitis. The River Festival, the Biennale, the Comedy Festival, the Irish Festival, the list goes on. Later came the David Cameron inspired Liverpool International Business Festival, lavishly funded. Um, it has left no trace. Uh, that's the festival, of course, not David Cameron. Um, reading Festival Cities really helped me to get all this into focus because John and Margaret Gold distinguish between audience festivals and business festivals. Audience festivals tend to be low budget, uh, in small spaces, without premieres, staffed by volunteers, with a, but with a very strong focus on satisfying their audiences because they operate on ticket sales, essentially. Business festivals tend to be high budget, feature premieres, cultural industry big hitters, in big spaces, corporate hospitality, and they tend to operate with national and local government support, as well as business uh, sp sponsorship. Festival cities also help me to see that city festivals are not the invention of some 20th century marketing guys. They've been around since the earliest times and they're an essential part of what cities offer, bringing people together, performance and audiences on a big scale. Early festivals seem to have been rather rough edged. I love the description of Stratford's early annual fairs as plebeian, brash and raw. I probably have enjoyed them, but surely these were archetypal audience festivals. The festivals John and Margaret investigate in their case studies are essentially business festivals. They're professionally organized with economic and even political objectives beyond sheer enjoyment, eating, drinking and entertainment. And as John and Margaret explained, they've looked at Venice Biennale, Salzburg, Cannes and Edinburgh, asking the questions, how did these festivals emerge? Who or what has driven them to international significance and, and what is their role and future? Well, I thought it's a very timely, very well written and almost jargon free book. In fact, the only time I encountered any thickets of jargon so beloved of some academics is when other writers are quoted and even then a kind explanation follows. What about the future? What's the, the future for festival cities and indeed for cities as a whole? Well, as you probably noticed, the pessimists are out and about. The civil servant authors of a recent report on priorities for UK rail investment actually wondered whether the pandemic might actually cause cities to be abandoned. Amazing to read that sort of stuff in an official report. Um, I've been working recently with an amazing character called Ray Mia, who uh, is, was formerly the executive vice president of uh, Universal Music Group in California, and is now busily trying to set up uh, rather successfully a music business ecosystem in Liverpool. And he's introduced me to what leisure consultants are saying about festivals and events. 
They say that, that festivals and events occupy what they call the third space for leisure and socialising. The first space being the home, the second work, and the third, the public arenas, bars and restaurants, where which festivals have occupied. But they also talk about the emergence of a fourth space, the digital space. Now, if you think that stands, sounds a little fanciful, just stand back for a moment, because not long ago, this book launch would have been taking place in the third space. Now, here we are in the fourth. Bring your own glass of wine. Could festivals, conferences and book launches all move into the fourth space? Well, theory is going to be tested in practice over the next few years. Maybe those trapped working from home with their emails, remote monitoring of mouse activity and endless Zoom meetings will love life in the fourth space. Or maybe they will be longing to get away to the tents, the mud and the discomfort of real audience festivals like cities, festivals, have been around for a long time. So my guess is that they will pass the famous Heineken test, refreshing the parts that other events cannot reach. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Liam. <laughs> okay, so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Smith. He's reader in tourism and events at the University of Westminster. And his research uh, focuses on events as tools for the regeneration, revitalization of cities and on urban tourism, particularly the role of iconic projects and monumental urbanism and tourism. So he's author of Events in Urban Regeneration, which was published in 2012, Events in the City Using Public Spaces as Events Venues in 2016, and co-author of Destination London, the, Expan the Expansion of the Visitor Economy in 2019. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you, um, Maggie. Yeah, hi. And um, again, thank you for inviting me to comment. Um, I suddenly realised there, yeah, that book um, published in 2019 on the expansion of the visitor economy in London wasn't particularly well timed. But um, anyway, we can't, I suppose we can, we can never plan for these sorts of things. Um, I think Festival Cities is a, a much anticipated book, and I don't want that to come across as a euphemism for how long it took to uh, materialise. It's a genuine reflection on uh, how much people have been looking forward to, uh, um, to, to reading it. Um, it's a fascinating book. I think the highest compliment you can have as an author is to say that the work is, is interesting and you know, a genuine pleasure to read. And this book definitely um, comes into that category. It's written by two of the nicest people in academia as well. I should say that. So uh, um, John and Maggie, they're good, they're good role models for academics because they write about things that they're genuinely passionate about and interested in. They're not necessarily trying to follow the research funding or trying to um, you know, sort of write about what everyone else is writing about. They're writing about what, they, what they're passionate about. Um, just really want to keep it quite brief, but maybe go through what I see as the sort of main contributions of the book, which um, I have read most of, not all of, but I have read most of the, the book. I got a, a kindly sent an advanced copy. Um, so what the, I mean, the most obvious contribution is the historical perspective, which is, um, you know, we've come to expect from uh, the goal. So in my own books, history tends to get relegated to a, a sort of token chapter at the start. But um, John and Maggie tend to do these things properly and have a, and a, a provide a really uh, sound introduction to um, the historical development of festivals in, in various urban contexts. So that's obviously a really strong contribution of the book. Um, the second really strong contribution is in the sort of introductory chapter, I think. So there's some really fundamental issues addressed there, some really fundamental ideas addressed. Obviously, John talked about their conception of a festivalization and the fact that they've sort of provided quite a nice, simple um, account of that, looking at the way in which um, festivals change urban places effectively. So try and consolidate a lot of that thinking into a much more simple and straightforward uh, framework. The case study chapters, are obviously a key contribution to and, and, and Maggie's synopsis there was really useful because I think the most interesting things from my perspective about those chapters were number one, yeah, this idea that how festivals have maybe spilled over out of their original um, venues and locations and started to inhabit and permeate uh, a much wider range of 
locations in the city. So that idea of how the festivals have sort of gradually permeated through and, and in the various um, cities. So that's really interesting. And secondly, something that I think is really neglected in the current literature, the way that these iterative festivals actually do leave quite significant physical legacies. So we often assume that maybe these big um, one-off mega events are, are quite fundamental in shaping cities in terms of their physical development. But actually what this book um, proves is that even these sort of annual festivals, even though they're often seen as quite ephemeral and transient, they actually do have quite a significant physical effect on the, on the cities that host them. And there's lots of interesting sort of bits about various venues and, uh, and, and parts of cities that have, that have been developed as a, as a result of um, festivals being staged year on year on year. The conclusions are also really interesting. So from a personal perspective, I had a real interest in those because obviously they talk about COVID, but there's also a couple of sections which talk about the way in which uh, events um, do occupy public spaces and some of the resistance to that and some of the complex issues regarding access to public space and whether or not these festivals are always welcome sort of incursions. And then the related issue of securitization, the way that festivals have had to be increasingly securitized and the way that that also folds into the way in which our cities have become increasingly securitized as well. So there's some really interesting stuff there. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really, really good contribution to the literature and um, I would really encourage you to get hold of a copy and at the very least get your institution to, to order a, an e-copy. So thank you for um, inviting me to, to comment on the book. Thank you very much. And then finally, that brings us to Graham Evans. So he's Professor of Creative and Cultural Economy at the London College of Fashion. Um, and he's involved, fascinatingly, I think, with the move of the college to um, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Um, and, you know, all the sort of interesting uh, uh, regeneration elements that are going on there. Um, so, He's written extensively on mega events, creative economy, event legacy, um, and most recently edited a book on mega events, placemaking, regeneration, and city regional development. So um, over to you, Graham. Okay, thank you, Maggie and John. Can you hear me okay? I don't have a plug-in mic. Yeah, good. Yeah, so good to see some uh, long lost faces. Uh, I won't say old faces for obvious reasons, but... Um, and also to put some faces to, to names as well. So that's that's really nice. I'm actually, I'm actually retired, so I'm officially emeritus professor, which means I've got a bit of distance from all this um, ac academic discourse stuff. So it's a bit of a novelty. Um, I haven't read the book cover to cover yet. I've only got the e-book, so, um, but now I'm retired, of course, so I have time to do that um, in theory. So firstly, yeah, congrats to Maggie and Gold for their great book. It's good to have a publication dedicated to cultural festivals, particularly those that are precursors to the, as the book goes on, the proliferation of arts festivals and to um, chart their formation really in time and place, you know, the classics of Venice, Edinburgh, Salzburg and so on, really all staples in the cultural tourist calendar, but also examples as the, the book expounds of a, a widening footprint and audience. Um, as Maggie said, from the Edinburgh Fringe, which has long dominated the original and outgrown the original festival that nobody really gives a damn about and spin-offs, literature, film, jazz festivals, in the case of Edinburgh, Venice, of course, Biennale, precursor to Edinburgh, that was used as a model, I think, um, with their architecture, film, and other, other festivals that have followed from the art festival. I mean, in Venice, which is one of the festivals I've studied over time, I mean, the example of the permanence of the Giardini theme park, you know, where they've got these very quirky national pavilions, it really belies any idea that the, the festival is ephemeral or temporary. Uh, even international expos now expect several pavilions and structures to remain after the event, uh, in addition to the host, which is always the, the grander, more expensive one that they, they expect and spend the money because it's going to be going to be permanent. So this, this kind of regional identity and expansive dimension, we, we did consider in the, the book Maggie mentioned in late 29 on mega events. Um, um, John and Maggie have a chapter don't draw on brownfield sites and, and, and mega events, but with festivals no longer just site-based and locations deliberately chosen as part of wider regeneration and urban fringe really expansion schemes. And it can be seen with Milan's Expo, which was situated out of the city center between an agricultural region seeking to widen its tourism profile to a less than successful regional European city of culture, jointly offered by Marseille and Provence, 
But as it turned out, they were both politically and economically incompatible areas and administrations. We didn't really work as a kind of wider regional effort. I mean, Maastricht, which is my temporary hometown a decade ago, I was working out of the university for four or five years, failed to pull off as Greg knows well, because he was backing another losing horse. <laughs> Uh, a Dutch European city of culture bid as a, as a re regional kind of Belgian, French, Dutch cross border, really culturally imagin imaginary, which was a bit too much, I think, for the uh, uh, for the commission um, panel. Uh, so it seems that cultural identity is more successful when not just place based, uh, as the book does discuss in the case of pride, carnivals, St. Patrick's Day parades, for example, that can tap into obviously diaspora, such as in you know the London and Toronto carnivals that were spin offs. From the Caribbean and the, you know, the uh, uh, Brazilian forebears, and therefore sustain a kind of generic brand. So even here, cultural identity is not assured, of course. For example, in these carnival masks where the original Afro-Caribbean community has becomes outnumbered by Latin American cultural groups and their bands and floats, as in Notting Hill. Um, Toronto's carnival many years ago was had to be relocated from its traditional downtown routes to an island. Uh, ostensibly for health and safety reasons, having um, outgrown the city streets. But of course, it's auth authenticity and it's place-based place, place -based, uh, routes. And Notting Hill similarly has had to resist pressure over the years to being relocated to Hyde Park. Uh, so maintaining the sense of place is not guaranteed or necessarily understood by those people that control and manage these things. So as communities grow and change, uh, as, as the book um, you know, expounds really, accommodating the new while maintaining the old, it's quite a challenge. I remember in, in New York, I've got family in New York, as Greg does, for instance, the, the number of cultural ethnic festivals long filled the city calendar of free weekends. They, they were full, they couldn't allow any more, uh, leaving new groups having to wait for old ones to die out. I mean, I don't know what, you, you know, do you, do you leave it until there are so many people with, uh, you don't have Irish, <laughs> Irish roots, um, it's not enough of them that they, they lose their festival slot and, and another cultural group moves in. And who, who decides this? Who's the arbiter here? So there, there's a lot of nuances and cultural politics underneath a lot of these, um, uh, these cultural festivals. And so the, I think the importance of place does therefore seem to be important where the urban environment presents a, you know, a symbolic and practical case. Uh, for example, going back to the case study in the book, the Venice Architecture Biennale, which alternates, as, as we know, with the Art Biennale, is housed in the Arsenale complex, uh, in re those redundant, beautiful naval buildings at Waterside, uh, for the time being, because it's still questionable what the future regeneration of that site and area will be. But it uses this backdrop in a way the art festival doesn't, does not. So it's more about ideas, if you like, concepts, you know, very architectural, you could say, than actually selling art and artists, as the art biennale tends to be now but it does receive less media coverage as a result, which is interesting, but just an observation. It did remind me that in London, a group of us established the first London Architecture Biennale in 2004. And John, John and Maggie, you didn't list this in your proliferation chapter. So I have to wrap your knuckles there. So make a note for the next edition, 1984, London Architecture Biennale. It was originally based in Clerkenwell where several architecture and building firms were based. Uh, and this location, and Steve remembers this, we worked in that area, didn't we, Steve, considerably, next to Smith, Smithfield Market, in front of where St. Bartholomew's Molyneux Fair was held. And believe it or not, that fair was ran from eight, 1133, that's 1133, to 1855. So you could say it's the kind of mother of all cultural festivals. And it, it only closed when the Victorians, the city closed it for debauchery and disorder. In a way, so that was probably the beginning, I'd say, of the sanitization of festivals. But let's, let's face it, other than and I've got posters on my wall here at the Bath Blues Festival in 1970, you know, arriving there in mud in the middle of the night. I mean, they're a bit raunchy, but they were nothing compared to the, the Bartholomew's Fair. So I think the sanitization of festivals has been going on for a long, long time. Um, just another observation. I mean, in that first event, we herded cattle and sheep, believe it or not, this was in the middle of London. But we didn't slaughter them, of course, this time, but across artificial grass and use the surrounding buildings as venues, um, we were kind of retreading the steps of past centuries in an otherwise modern festival celebrating architecture in the city. What could be more modern? So it's interesting the event, and this is, fits with your proliferation theme, that the event is now an annual month long architecture festival uh, across the city, which includes foreign embassies, which enables international architects to participate. So within 10 years of a very local situated festival, it, it had transformed into a citywide international one. Although as with most, this has lost its roots in the process. So it's an interesting uh, example of how that 
process has accelerated uh, that we've seen, you know, really over the centuries now. So as, as we know, you know, lots of textbooks on this, the festival is now fairly ubiquitous and a device to lengthen the visitor calendar, package programs at theatres and other cultural venues and sites. And so it's become a place branding strategy uh, commonly used to market a city or area and importing concepts and adapting these in other places is also tried and tested, even if it's a bit, a bit naff. An example is the Nuit Blanche or the late night festivals, which originated in Paris. Although I think the Russians claim that St. Petersburg White Night was also uh, an originator. And this spawned an international network. There's about 150 plus now around the world and even the charter, very French kind of bureaucratic approach to these things. But however, importing a festival brand can be problematic where national pride and identity is concerned. So when London asked, asked us to look at the Nuit Blanche event as the model for London, adopting this Parisian brand, if you, brand, if you like, the countries like Toronto and Montreal had no difficulty uh, emulating. Um, the Parisian brand wasn't acceptable to London, the mayor at, the, at that time, despite its success. So London went ahead. And um, nonetheless, with museums and galleries, as some of you know, if you're Londoners, hosting late or all night programs at museums and galleries under the Museum Late's brand. So the concept, but not the brand, was taken up. So shades of Brexit there, if you, if you like, even though this was several years ago. Um, so I think while the classic festivals that the book covers struggle with carrying capacity, staying fresh and authentic, a long queue of new festivals vie for attention uh, and wider distribution of cultural and economic activity, I suppose. So in, in particular, former um, trade fairs, exhibitions, notably in China and the Middle East, there's a whole world out there of festival trade events, which are coupled with, fest with festivals that have the same kind of impact that are of a scale bigger than, than anything that we're considering, you know, that we're used to talking about in the, uh, in the West, covering traditional building industry, um, arts, crafts festivals in the Middle East, for instance, uh, massive annual events that are, that, that are pilgrimages that outstrip a lot of the, the, the cultural festivals that we, we refer to. So we do need to be conscious. There's another world out there of cultural festivals that we, we barely talk about or understand. And now we've also got the festivals which are around the industries of new media and tech, which are of course taking over the world um, uh, as well. Uh, and the Edinburgh Fringe, you could say the Edinburgh Fringe is, could be viewed as a trade fair for budding theater producers and performers. Likewise, Cannes Film Festival and its emulators. These are highly commercial trade trade events. So to call them cultural festivals, you know, you could you could turn it around and say, hmm, yeah, um, let, less cultural, actually more, more about commerce. Um, so I'll finish up. And festivals and live events are of course on hold. We talked about COVID due to the pandemic. And I think this does allow for reflection and new festival thinking. I assume this is going on uh, and regrouping because as Maggie says, many institutions will not have survived this extended closure. So the question, will latent demand be so high to fuel a resurgence and guarantee attendance and ticket sales? Because uh, the economic side is important as well. There may be the demand, there may not be the money to pay for it with, it, with, with expensive tickets. Uh, so will it, the other side of that, will international and kind of intra-regional travel be slow to recover? I think it will for obvious reasons and maybe never reach its uh, previous levels. So I think live events and experience have been a, coror a corollary to social atomization. Um, and the, you know, the debilitating effects of the digital world, a savior of music in particular, uh, which has lost much of its income to download streaming. So they've been so, that's why they've been so negatively affected by this, this kind of closure. Uh, so the appeal of festivals, I mean, you wouldn't expect it to, to diminish uh, given our experience and that kind of latent pent up um, need and demand. But I think the question whether place becomes more important again in this future scenario you know, there's obviously a promotion of staycations now rather than people going, uh, traveling abroad for their cultural experiences. That, that does remain to be seen. Uh, but I think this book uh, provides, with a, provides, provides us with an excellent foundation and a reminder of how cultural festivals have established and grown and really how their proliferation has reflected um, both the cultural and urban politics uh, of the day. So I, I commend this book to the house, if that's um, not too much of a mixed metaphor. Good. Thank you very much, Craig. <laughs> okay, well, that concludes the kind of formal part of the um, proceeding. So I'll pass over to Bessie now because she'll sort of field any questions. Is there is, is there wine, Maggie? Sorry? Is there wine? I'm looking for the I'm looking for uh, <laughs> not not here, just uh, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's a great shame because we would have it had a budget actually yes. so yeah. um, we could have uh, 
put on something quite good, but uh, the Excellent. occasion does not uh, allow. So I'll leave off. <laughs> okay, so over to Bessie. Sure. Well, thank you so much. Um, I mean, well, again, congratulations, huge congratulations to the two authors and your presentation, absolutely fabulous. And also thank you for the, um, all the illuminating comments from um, the external guests, um, really adding a lot of richness to the addition and also to our, to our event. I've just uh, very quickly look at the clock. We only have like 10 minutes left and we I suppose that we would have quite a few um, questions from the floor. I want to open up to the floor immediately to capture some of those comments or questions. Can I, um, can, if anybody have a questions or want to make a comment, please could you raise your hands? Anyone? Uh, Wes, I think we've got a question from, um, I can't see the, the actual name, I'm afraid, on your, on your username. Uh, it's Juliet, it's Juliet Day. Hi, Juliet. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, John and Maggie. Um, my question is just how do you think, uh, I mean, this is looking forward to the future rather than back into the history of festivals, but how do you think that the digital spaces that we've been inhabiting so much over the last year will transform the physical places of festivals in the future? Will we just see a return to festivals as they were before, or we, will we see some new hybrid combinations of the digital and the physical? I, th I, I think there is inevitably going to be a, a great desire to get back together again, to congregate uh, and to enjoy that experience. But I'm sure that it, it is also gonna help the extend the footprint of the festival. Um, we're seeing now all sorts of ways in which a festival experience can be can be presented by live streaming and uh, any manner of uh, uh, devices able to 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 consume these things. Um, I think that, that uh, there will be a greater richness. To be honest, Julia, I think you will find that um, people who organise festivals are extremely innovative people, and that they will fi find new fusions and new ideas to to take from this. No, not really. I mean, there is a vested interest, obviously, in using the, phys the physical plant and getting back to, to using that. But um, I think people's behaviours have uh, changed irrevocably as well. So, um, and, and more people um, are using these other platforms. So I think that will, will continue. Yeah. So, um... Have I got another hands um, that, that I missed? Karen is trying to get through. Yes, it's Karen next. Is it Karen? Hello. Hi. Karen. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for a lovely presentation. I'm really, really looking forward to, to reading the book. Uh, I'm a PhD student in art history at the Department for Culture and Aesthetics in Stockholm University, Sweden. And I'm researching uh, uh, victory parades in early modern times here in Sweden. And I'm interested in the claiming of space uh, in these processions, the, in the city uh, space. And I'm, I'm wondering if you are touching upon, I mean, the difference between uh, the, uh, I mean, the, uh, the more permanent uh, pavilions uh, when the audience goes to specific places to take, uh, take place in the, in the festivities, as opposed to processions uh, walking around town as in the Rio uh, festival or um, the carnival or for example, pride uh, uh, carnivals where, where the uh, audience is more stationary and the, the participants are moving about. So if you could uh, yeah, I mean the, comment on that. Yes, I mean, a number of festivals have seen parades as a really good way of engaging with, with populations. I mean, the Manchester International Festival 
uh, introduced one. I mean, Edinburgh's had them as well. Um, and, and, and so, and, and there is a sort of tradition, isn't there really, mm -hmm. of, 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 of the parade. I mean, um, at, a, at a local level, um, you know, linked to traditional festivals, May Day or in the summer and all of that kind of thing as well. So there's a, there is a strong tradition and it does, as I say, um, it's attractive in some of the larger festivals because it does sort of take the festival out into, into the community. I mean, the answer to your question is actually both. Um, we, we were interested in carnival in the first place because of, because of its transgressive element, that, uh, the, the, the idea of turning the world upside down, the, 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 the king of the fools and, and, and all this sort of thing. And what one's seen with carnival is the way in which carnival has been channeled. Uh, increasingly into into behaviour which is spectacle, and we one of the reasons why we took arts festivals and carnival as as our two elements is that they they touch on the themes which you've been talking there about there. There there is with the arts festival a tendency towards constructing pavilions, constructing permanent infrastructure. Whereas Carnival still has this, this curious ambiguity to it, whereby in part it's about transgressive behaviour, about, uh, about taking the streets and so on, and in part about uh, the, the, the tourist element, about raising, raising revenue in, in the sense of uh, creating spectacle which people can participate in. Carnival was always used to be about participation and it increasingly becomes rather more divorced spectacle. So, so we had these, these things in mind. I, I'm afraid I can't tell you about Swedish victory parades. Um, I'd very much like to, if we have more time, I'd very much like to hear you on the subject. <laughs> yeah. I hope in the future, I hope we will meet in some other uh, Please, uh, arrangement. Do, do, yeah. do send an email. I'd be interested in taking it further. I will, thank you so much. Thank you. So I think we have, we can accommodate one more question. Um, um, Wesley, that, if I can, um, Wesley, if I can just quickly sure. uh, jump in. Uh, sorry, my, my uh, raise hand button doesn't seem to work. So I just wanted to take a second just to really thank uh, everybody here for this incredible discussion. And um, as we, um, you know, as we uh, are developing this series of events to do with these, uh, these topics surrounding, you know, the idea of, of uh, uh, events, art, the city, the monuments, etc. Um, you know, it's really powerful to, to hear this, this insight. And particularly today, I think one thing that, that really stuck with me is um, this, this combination of, the, the, it's the resilience of festivals and uh, across the different um, contributions, we heard this idea of resilience being both uh, based in the, in the kind of inherent adaptability of festivals and also on the human need to congregate together. Um, and so I think somewhere there in between these two forces, we, we've got, we will keep the future of festivals, uh, COVID or no COVID, but, um, but it's really, thank you so much. Um, Wesley, I was wondering whether perhaps you want to just mention um, uh, our launch in, in a few weeks. Sure. Well, um, I just want to make sure that there is no more questions because I know that we have a, lot, a, a shorter kind of Q&A time. Um, I, so just kind of one more chance, if anybody want to make a comment and also ask the questions, feel free to do that because we don't want to cut you short. <laughs> I, I've got a quick question, but I, I'm like uh, Yatsik, I can't find my hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nick. That's, that's great, yeah, Nick, go on. Because just very quickly. Yeah, sure. uh, I mean, John, John's point about this issue of the transgressive aspect of the festival is a really interesting one. Mm. Um, I mean, there is a comment that was raised by um, Carsten Harris, a very well-known um, philo American philosopher, architectural historian. He talked about festival space as a means of dreaming utopia. Um, and he was kind of looking at the issue of the ethical dimension of architecture. What is lacking in the physicality of buildings can somehow be conceived even momentarily, ephemerally within festival experience or festivalization, I suppose. But I'm always interested in 
you know, looking at the historical context of that, we think about festivals as about boundaries, it's about uh, processions between different locations, about temporality, about the momentary, you know, the occasions, the, the high points where great um, uh, rituals take place, uh, where people come, come together. And I guess I'm just kind of wondering about when is a festival not a festival, you know, in the contemporary world, because the word is used so loosely in so many different ways. I just wonder whether we're losing a sense of what it at least historically meant, or do, is it open to reinterpretation? I think undoubtedly it, it, it is used to the point where it ceased to mean anything. Um, the, uh, we've uh, identified in the preface of the book some, some of the more ludicrous uh, uses of the, the word festival. The, the Louisiana Oil and Shrimp Festival was, was one favorite. <laughs> Um, I'd like to go back though, to, to, your, to your point about, yeah. about trans, transgression, if, if I may, um, rather than the, the end point, because one of the things about, about Carnival was it was always about transgression and, and the, yeah. the sense of being able to uh, overturn all the rules, and yet those rules occurred within, the, within an accepted order. There was always an, a, a, an understanding of exactly how far you could go. Mm. and also an understanding that these rules would, would be back tomorrow. So that there was, there's always been this tension between what appears on the surface to be freedom and, and, and accessibility and the re reimposition of, of the, the order behind it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I take your, your point in, entirely about the, the use of the, the word festival. Um, like a lot of things, it becomes a, a way of presenting something, which is actually is very exciting. But the, the idea that festivals should have some sense of joy or, or at least um, the sense that you're commemorating something important. Whereas uh, the overuse of that, the, the, the word festival would seem to deny that. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Nick, for the um, for the questions. I think that is just a good way and a great way to end this session today. So I want to thank all the speakers and also and also um, the two authors again. Congratulations! And um, before you all go, and a little bit of publicity here, um, the AAD sessions is um, having um, another sessions next week um, on creativity and representation. So um, do come over to join us. But more importantly, um, our centre is in this infantile. So basically, we haven't really have our official launch, but it is coming now, and it is on the 25th of February, and you're all invited. Now, um, uh, Hannah's already uh, posed up the, um, the website, um, which lists all the AAD sessions, and you can register there, including the launch. We will uh, very shortly include the access link where every one of you can uh, register. Um, to come and join us. So um, I would like to thank all of you again and a very good evening to you all. And I'm sure that um, just like festival, we'll reoccur, uh, we'll recongregate our space for a real glass of champagne. <laughs> the time will come. <laughs> well, see, thank you very much for hosting this. It's been, yeah. it's been a great My experience. pleasure. Absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Take care. Bye. Goodbye.